in this lecture, we will discuss how abnormality was viewed and treated in the past. Historians who have examined the unearthed bones, artwork, and other remains of ancient societies have concluded that these societies probably regarded abnormal behavior as the work of evil spirits. People in prehistoric societies apparently believe that all events around and within them resulted from the actions of magical, sometimes sinister beings who controlled the world. In particular, they viewed the human body and mind as a battleground between external forces of good and evil. Abnormal behavior was typically interpreted as a victory by evil spirits, and the cure for such behavior was to force the demons from the victim's body. This supernatural view of abnormality may have begun as far back as the Stone Age, a half million years ago. Some skulls from that period, recovered in Europe and South America, show evidence of an operation in which a stone instrument, or trephine, was used to cut a circular section of the skull. The purpose of opening the skull was to release the evil spirits that were supposedly causing the problem. Later societies also explained abnormal behavior by pointing to possession by demons. The treatment for abnormality in these early societies was often exorcism. The idea was to coax the evil spirit to leave or to make the person's body an uncomfortable place in which to live. A shaman or priest might recite prayers, plead with the evil spirits, insult the spirit, perform magic, make loud noises, or have the person drink bitter potions. If these techniques failed, the shaman performed a more extreme form of exorcism, which is whipping or starving the person. In the years from roughly 500 BC to 500 AD, when the Greek and Roman civilizations thrived, philosophers and physicians often offered different explanations and treatments for abnormal behaviors. To treat psychological dysfunction, Hippocrates sought to correct the underlying physical pathology. He believed, for instance, that the excess of black bile could be reduced by a quiet life and diet of vegetables, temperance, exercise, and even bleeding. Hippocrates focused on internal causes for abnormal behavior, was shared by the great Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle. The enlightened view of Greek and Roman physicians and scholars were not enough to shake ordinary people's beliefs in demons. With the decline of Rome, demonology views and practices became popular once again. A growing distrust of science spread throughout Europe. From 500 to 1350 AD, the period known as the Middle Ages, the power of the clergy increased greatly throughout Europe. In those days, the church rejected scientific forms of investigation and it controlled all education. Religious beliefs, which were highly superstitious, came to dominate all aspects of life. Deviant behavior, particularly psychological abnormality, was seen as evidence of Satan's influence. The Middle Ages were a time of great stress and anxiety. 
It was not until the Middle Ages drew to a close that demonology and its methods began to lose favor. During the early part of the Renaissance, a period of flourishing cultural and scientific activity from about 1400 to 1700, demological views of abnormality continued to decline. The first physician to specialize in mental illness believed that the mind was as susceptible to sickness as the body was. He is now considered the founder of the modern study of psychopathology. The care of people with mental disorders continued to improve in this atmosphere. Unfortunately, these improvements in care began to fade by the mid-16th century. Government officials discovered that private homes and community residences could house only a small percentage of those with severe mental disorders and that medical hospitals were too few and too small. More and more, they converted hospitals and monasteries into asylums, institutions whose primary purpose was to care for people with mental illness. These institutions were begun with the intention that they would provide good care. Once the asylum started to overflow, however, they became virtual prisons where patients were held in filthy conditions and treated with unspeakable cruelty. In some asylums, patients bound in chains cried out for all to hear. The hospitals even became a popular tourist attraction. People were eager to pay to look at the howling and gibbering inmates. As 1800 approached, the treatment of people with mental disorders began to improve once again. Historians usually point to La Bessetere, an asylum in Paris for male patients, as the first site of asylum reform. In 1793, during the French Revolution, Philippe Pinel was named the chief physician there. He argued that the patients were sick people whose illnesses should be treated with sympathy and kindness rather than chains and beatings. He unchained the patients and allowed them to move freely about in the hospital grounds, replaced the dark dungeons with sunny, well-ventilated rooms, and offered support and advice. His approach proved remarkably successful. Many patients who had been shut away for decades improved greatly over a short period of time and were released. He later brought similar reforms to the mental hospitals in Paris for female patients. Meanwhile, an English Quaker named William Turk was bringing similar reforms to Northern England. In 1796, he founded the York Retreat, a rural estate where about 30 mental patients lived as guests in quiet country houses and were treated with a combination of rest, talk, prayer, and manual work. The methods of Pennell and Turk called moral treatment because they emphasized moral guidance and humane and respectful techniques caught on throughout Europe and the United States. Patients with psychological problems were increasingly perceived as potential productive human beings who deserve individual care, including discussions of their problems, useful activities, work, companionship, and quiet. By the early years of the 20th century, the moral treatment movement had ground to a halt in both the United States and Europe. 
public mental hospitals were providing only custodial care and ineffective medical treatments were becoming more and more overcrowded every year. Long-term hospitalization became the rule once again. 